in this corner, standing five foot nothing, weighing about 103 pounds, this kid Death David from Bethlehem. And in this corner, standing nine foot six, weighing 520 pounds, winner of numerous battles, an undefeated champion, Goliath of Gath. Can you imagine the odds that Las Vegas would put on that fight? If you just had one little shekel to wager on David, you would have had wealth untold because of those odds. Because who would give him any chance at all against this man, Goliath? We need to go back from the very beginning of the chapter and let's just put the story in order. Here was the Philistine army that was camped somewhere between Sukkot and Azekah. And the Israelite army camped in the valley of Elah. And every day, this guy Goliath, six or nine foot six, his scale armor weighed about 126 to 130 pounds. He had a bronze helmet on his head, bronze greaves that covered his lower legs. He had a bronze javelin slung between his shoulder. He had a spear that the shaft of that spear was like that of a weaver's beam. And I looked on the internet concerning that. that that's pretty big folks, it would be about yay big around, and probably at least eight foot long. And at the end of that eight foot shaft was an iron spearhead that weighed 15 to 20 pounds. And as Dale pointed out in our class this morning, can you imagine the, the power, the strength of anybody who could hold that spear in their hand and you held a spear pretty much at mid shaft so that you could throw it can you imagine somebody holding a spear and four feet out there there's about a 20 pound weight on the end of it but that was Goliath of Gath and this guy came out on the mountainside and he would just talk the army of Israel and he says why do you guys come out here all dressed up for battle you ain't doing anything why do you bother putting on all your battle gear if you're not gonna fight that kind of reminds me of our situation today why do we pray why do we ask God to help us in our endeavors to serve him unless we're actually going to serve him why should we pray for strength to stand against satan if we're not going to stand if we're just going to give in in the first place and he asked another question that i think is very pertinent and it's one that's easy to overlook he says are you not servants of saul do you not see what the problem is there? That's exactly who they were. They were servants of Saul. They were supposed to be the army of the living God of the Israelites. But that's not who they saw themselves as. They saw themselves as just mere men who were servants to this king that they asked for that they demanded, give us a king like all the other nations. And so as Goliath would come out and issue his challenge, he'd say, listen, 
send a guy out here to fight with me and here's the deal if he is able to prevail over me and kill me then all of Philistia will be your servants but on the other hand if just on the mere chance I'm able to kill him then Israel will serve us and be our slaves our servants and to top all of that off he would add this insult, I defy the army of Israel. And then he says, give me a man. Give me a man. And that too is easy for us to overlook, isn't it? Because God, through his inspired New Testament writer, has told us as his children, act like men. Be a man. That is to say, you're going to claim to be one of my children? Act like it. You're going to say that you no longer serve Satan? Then act like it. But be a man. And the scriptures say that Saul in all Israel was dismayed and afraid. And it says that Goliath came out for 40 consecutive days in the morning and in the evening time. And he issued that very same challenge. Now, the three oldest children of Jesse... Eliab, Abinadab, and Shema were all in the army of Israel. Very likely they had been drafted into the army as God had warned them what would take place if they decided they wanted a king. That he's going to take your, your sons and your daughters. And that seems to be what has happened here with the three older uh, sons of Jesse. They're in the army. And... Jesse is thinking about his three sons and so he calls David in and he says David I want you to go over and I want you to check on your brothers they're get this they're over fighting the Philistines and the only reason why Jesse said that is because he didn't know that they were over there trembling in their boots and that no fighting was going on at all. And he said, David, I want you to go over there and I want you to take some provisions for your brothers. I want you to take some roasted grain. I want you to take, uh, I want you to take uh, some uh, cuts of cheese uh, for the uh, captain of the thousand. And uh, he says, uh, you know, I need you to take some bread for your brothers. And I want you to go over there and I, want, I just want you to check on the welfare of your brothers to see how they are doing. And so David gladly obeyed his dad. He gave somebody charge over the sheep while he was gone. And he went, as we talked about in our Bible class this morning, the 15 mile journey over to where the battle was supposed to be going on. And it says there in the scriptures that as he approached the place where the battle is supposed to be going on, the army of Israel was all decked out in their battle gear, in their war array, it says, their battle array, and they were all shouting the war cry. <laughs> but they weren't fighting anybody. They just went out there. And, and again, I just want to emphasize, folks, that if we're going to put on our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we've got a lot of battles to fight. And we've got a lot of courage to demonstrate in our service to our God. It doesn't seem to me like David had any fear at all. It's, it says that he went to the battle line. I take that to mean he went to the very front line of the battle. And it seems to me that there is absolutely no fear in David whatsoever. Nothing like what Saul and the army of Israel are having to deal with. And yet I think that the reason why is a very important reason. 
Because as David made that 15 mile journey, God went with him. And David knew that God went with him. And as he was approaching the battlefront there, here came old Goliath. <laughs> and once again, he said, listen, guys, I, I'm only going to give you one more chance. Send the guy out here to fight with me and we'll do battle. And once again, there's something there in the scriptures that is easy to overlook. It's three little words. And David heard. Yeah, the word uh, this is interpolated. It's there in italics. I don't think we really need that word. It just simply says David heard. And I think that the importance of that is simply this. That David heard this uncircumcised Philistine heathen defying God's army. Because you see, in David's mind, it wasn't Saul's army, it's still God's army. And David heard what Goliath was saying, and he didn't like it. He didn't like it. And unlike Saul, king of Israel, who stood head and shoulders above everybody else, and the entire army of Israel, David didn't like it. And he was prepared to do something about it. And the army of Israel was not. As a matter of fact, as Goliath issued his challenge once again, it says that the army fled in fear. Now, try to picture that for just a moment. David is approaching the army lines, the, the battle lines by the, by the Israelite army. And here comes Goliath. He issues his challenge. And all of a sudden, David looks around, and all of, the, all of the army of Israel, all he sees is their backside. They're running for cover. And I see it, at least I see it this way, that David is kind of like pointing to Goliath, and well, what about him? Aren't, aren't you going to do anything about this guy? Are you just going to run with your tail tucked between your leg, as we say of, of dogs sometimes, you're just, going, you're just going to run and let him stand there and say those things? I think that David probably had the same thought in his head, and that is, are you, are you men or not? Are you not the army of God, and do you not remember any of the things any of the times that God delivered our, our forefathers out of the hands of their enemies. Well, David goes back to where the, the soldiers are encamped. And he hears this guy. He's already been talking, but he, he hears this guy. And he's telling another fellow, you know what? I, I, I'm not for sure about this guy Saul. I'm not really for sure. That's, that's, he's a very good king because he's as scared as we are. As a matter of fact, I think he's more scared than we are. And I'll tell you how scared that guy is. He has made an offer to anybody that will go out there and fight that giant. He'll give that man great riches. His family will made, be made free in Israel. <laughs> and here's the coup de grace. I mean, he's so scared, he's going to give one of his daughters to that person in marriage. And that way, his family will then be royalty. And he's right. I think Saul, King Saul, was more afraid than anybody. Because if you're willing to do that for somebody, anybody that will go fight the giant, you're flat scared. And we talked about just a smidgen in the Bible class this morning. I think that surely there had to be somebody in the army of Israel thinking, why in the world don't Saul go out there? He's bigger than us. He's head and shoulders above us. Now, anthropologists tell us that at this period of time in man's existence, the average 
height of people was probably somewhere around five foot six. That's based upon skeletal remains that they have from that period of time. So if Saul stood head and shoulders above somebody that's only five foot six, that still puts him real close to seven feet likely. He's a pretty big dude himself. And I'll tell you, if I was in that army, that would be my train of thought. Why don't Saul go? He's bigger than any of us. He's got the best chance. I tell you how scared Saul was. You remember what the deal was? If you kill me, the Philistines will serve you. But if I kill your man, y'all become our servants. Saul was so scared that he was willing to put the future of God's chosen people in the hands of just anybody that would go fight that giant. Knowing full well that more than likely... He's not going to win. David hearing this, or at least a part of that, he says, wait a minute, hold, hold on just a second. <laughs> Why did you say the king will give this guy? And they tell him. And David don't understand. He says, well, that won't be no fight. I'll go. I'll go and me and God will make quick work out of that dude. I mean, that ain't going to be no fight. And so some, one of the guys goes in and tells King Saul, Hey, King, we got a guy out here that says he'll go. Can you imagine the elation of Saul in his kingly tent hearing that somebody is willing to go fight this giant. He's probably in there boy, doing some sort of dance, you know. Big old grin on his face. Just happy as a pig in slop. And he is so relieved and he says, you say there's a guy out there that'll go fight? And he says, yes, sir. And he says, well, bring the idiot, I, I mean, bring, bring that fine, brave young soldier in here. And so they bring David in there, and it, <laughs> I tell you, there's just a lot of humor in the, in the Bible, and this is just one of the most humorous things I, I can think of. Here's Saul in there. He's dancing. He's humming. Boy, all right, all right, all right. We got it, honey. You know? And this guy brings in David, a 17-year-old kid, just barely five foot tall. And that grin that's so big turns to this huge frown that just falls off his face. As wait a minute. Are you kidding? What is this? Some kind of joke? This ain't April 1st. It's not April Fool's Day. What, what's this all about here? And he says, son, go, get, go on and get out of here. You're not able to go against that guy. He... He, you, you know, you're just a kid. You're, 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 a, you're, um, boy, you're just a runt. That's what I'm trying to tell you. You're just too small. You can't go out there. You, you haven't had any battle experience. And this guy has been fighting battles ever since his youth. He'll, he'll just make quick work out of you. He'll just eat you up for lunch. And David says, well, here's the thing, King. I was tending the sheep one day and this big old bear came and took one of the sheep in his mouth. And I went and grabbed that bear by the beard. And God delivered that bear into my hands and I was able to save that sheep out of the mouth of that bear. And on another occasion, the lion came along and tried the same thing and I went and I grabbed that lion. And God delivered that lion into my hands as well. And I saved the sheep on that occasion. This, this uncircumcised Philistine ain't going to be any bigger than those lions as far as and, and, and a bear. He said, it's not going to be any difference. I'm going to hit him. He's going to hit the ground. It's just, that's just it. it is, this isn't even going to be a fight. And so Saul says something that once again... Is somewhat easy to overlook, but it's very important for us to notice it. 
Saul says, go and may the Lord be with you. And as you read that account, if you pay close attention to it, what you're going to see is this is the first time God has entered into the picture at all. Saul and all Israel did not have God in their minds at all. At all. And that's what the problem was. They left God out of the picture. And so Saul says, well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you my armor. Son, I'm so proud of you. I'm going to give you my armor now. My armor. Now, Saul, seven feet tall or so, we talked about it in Dale's class, how big Goliath's head must have been. Well, Saul must have wore about a size eight and a half himself because he's close to seven foot tall. He says, I'm going to give you my armor. And he sets his helmet on David's head and it just swallows his head up in the chin strap and hits him way down here. And he puts his armor on him and it just absolutely, totally engulfs him and gives, gives him his sword. David can't even move. He can't even move. This is another thing that is easy for us to miss. Because Saul is trying to give David all this armor to go fight the Philistine with, he's still leaving God out of the picture. Have you ever thought about that? He's still leaving God out of the picture. Because in his mind, David needs all of this armor for battle. And David says, you know what, king? <laughs> First of all, this stuff don't fit. Second of all, I don't know anything about this stuff. I just need to go face this giant the way I faced that bear and that lion. And so Saul says, okay. And the scriptures say that David took his shepherd's crook. He had his slingshot. He stopped at the brook. He picked him up five, five stones and he went out to face Goliath. And Goliath came down. And as he sees David across the valley there and across the little brook there. He says, boy, you better get out of here. We got a fight going on here. There's a battle raging here. You get on out of here, kid. And David says, I know. Well, there's not much of a fight going on. I don't see any fighting going on. But I tell you this, Goliath, I came to take you. That's where it's at. And Goliath has to just let out this huge roar. Just laughing and says, boy, you know, I am so glad you came along. This is the funniest thing I ever heard in my life. It's been so boring because every day for 40 days I come out here and challenge the army of Israel. They don't listen. I just sat here for a while plunking rocks in the water there. And I just haven't had anything to do to amuse myself with. He says, and here you come along. And that satisfies that because, boy, I'm just going to eat you up. And David says, well, here's the thing. You come at me with a spear and a javelin and a sword. And I am here in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. And he is going to deliver you into my hands today. And I'm going to kill you. And it says that David then began to run toward the giant. And he reaches into his shepherd's pouch and gets a smooth stone, puts it into his slingshot and slings that thing around in helicopter type style. And just at the right moment lets it go and it just buries itself. And Goliath's forward. And he falls face forward onto the ground. Now the scriptures say that then David went and took his sword, Goliath's sword, because it says there was no sword in David's hand. 
that's another one of those things to take close attention to. And we'll talk about that in a minute. But it says that then David killed him. Look at the order that the Bible gives us. He hit him in the head with that stone. The giant fell down and then David killed him. Taking Goliath's sword and lopping his head off. And the reason why he was able to do that is because David said, the battle is the Lord's. Something that Saul and every single man in the army of Israel, including Eliab, Abinadab, and Shammah, who God passed over as the next king of Israel because their heart was not like David's heart. There's some lessons that we need to learn from this story. One of the lessons is a song that our children like to sing that we need to sing from time to time. This is probably one of the most favorite accounts in all the Bible for our youngsters. And a lot of times uh, in like uh, Bible classes or maybe vacation Bible school, we'll sing the song, Only a Boy Named David. Sing it with me. Only a boy named David, only a little sling. Only a boy named David, look, he could play and sing. Only a boy named David, only a rippling brook. Only a boy named David, and five little stones he took. And one little stone went in the sling, and the sling went round and round. And one little stone went in the sling, and the sling went round and round. And round and round and round and round and round and round and round. And one little stone went up in the air, and the giant came tumbling down. Yeah. I like that song. We shouldn't just reserve that for singing with our children. We need to sing that from time to time to remind us how come David was able to defeat this giant. There's some lessons that we want to consider very quickly from this account. First of all, we are in a battle for our souls, folks. Every single day, Satan, he's our giant. Satan taunts us every single day. He challenges us every single day. He asks, are you men or not? He wants to know, are you a member of the army of God or not? And we need to answer him yes. And the way that we answer him yes is by when he tempts us and when he gets after us, we go to God immediately and we ask for his help. We talked about it in the Bible class this morning, how that we are to put on the full armor of God. And I've, I've brought this to your attention before. But we're starting in verse 10. And before we're told to put on the armor of God, we're told to stand in the power and might of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm here to tell you that if you don't stand in the power and might of Jesus Christ... I don't care what armor you got on, our giant is going to beat us because he's too big for us, just like Goliath was too big for David. We need the strength of our Lord because he's done battle with Satan and he's won it. And he has given us the victory that we will just stand like men. Secondly, we must be daily, uh, God must be a part of our lives every single day. We can't just wait until some problem or some difficulty happens in our lives to call upon God to be with us and to deliver us. We need God every single day, every step of every single day. We need God to be there with us. Because life offers many challenges that we're just not strong enough for. And we need to ask God to be with us every day rather than just waiting 
until some big event might come into our lives and then call upon him. Thirdly, we must stand in the strength of our Lord. I talked about that just a moment ago. And lastly, folks, the battle is the Lord's. The battle is the Lord's. And the fact of the matter is, if we're going to get to heaven, we're going to get to heaven through the grace of God and the sacrifice of of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We obey the gospel of Jesus Christ and we put him on in baptism, but it is God's grace because none of those count for anything because we're unworthy, as Nick mentioned in his prayer before we observed and took the, the unleavened bread this morning. We are totally unworthy. And it doesn't make any difference what we do, we're still unworthy. We have to allow Jesus to be the master and the captain of our army that we are a part of. And we need to pledge our fidelity to him. And not go AWOL and not for certain defect to the enemy's army. The battle is the Lord's. And we have to let him pay the price for our sin that we could not pay. And then commit our daily lives a living sacrifice unto the Lord who died for us. Have you done that? Have you done that? Is there someone here this morning that is not in the Lord's army? Is there someone here this morning that is still on Satan's side? And you might not think that you are. But in reality, you are because Jesus made it clear. He says, you can only serve one or the other. There's no in between. You're either with me or you're against me, Jesus said. You're either with me or you're scattering abroad. You need to determine this morning where you stand. You need to take a good, critical, honest, objective look at yourself and ask yourself, okay, do I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? Well, yes, I do. Am I willing to turn from my life of sin, the old man of sin that I used to be, and become a new creature in Christ, and walk in newness of life, and walk by faith, following my, my Savior and my Lord, Jesus Christ? Yes, I will. Am I willing to make confession with my mouth that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God? <coughs> Am I willing to declare my commitment and my fidelity to Jesus, not only as my Savior, but as my Lord? Yeah, I'm willing to do that. Am I willing to bury that old man of sin that I put to death through repentance in the waters of baptism? Let the blood of Jesus Christ cleanse me of all my sins and rise up out of that watery grave a new creature in Christ, a new child of God, a new servant of my Lord Jesus Christ and walk with him for the rest of my life. And if you can answer yes to that, then you need to come this morning and obey the gospel while together we stand and sing this song. Zion's call sweetly rings over land and sea bidding us look to realms above while the light from the throne shines for you and me. Let us live to the call.